Being 703, I'd like to call the uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen of Situate from t for Tuesday, April 7th, 2009. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And uh, we have an agenda, and I know of no uh, adjustments to the agenda. So, motion, please. Move to accept the agenda. Second. The motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The uh, agenda is accepted. Do we have any walk ins? I understand we have. At least one. I saw a whole bunch of hands. Who do we have on walk-in? I know we got Mr. Moran or Morin. Correct, Moran. Moran. This is Banger. Okay, great. So, um, just a reminder to review all the rules regarding walk-in. The point of walk-in is to identify matters that are either immediately uh, time pressing or um, can be very easily solved. And if neither of those, what we're likely to do is just quickly map out a path uh, to address the situation, which could involve consultation with additional boards, commissions, committees, uh, or town hall, or, or set up a time to come before us again in the future. But we're not going to be getting into any um, significant back and forth of more than five minutes on each subject. Okay, so um, Mr. Moran, why not? You're closest to us. If you could please come forward and just uh, briefly identify yourself. Speaker Moran, 15 Buckwood Lane. We've had an ongoing problem across the street from me. Uh, the town has permitted a junkyard on the Paper Street. Uh, I live across from this junkyard. Since 2005, I've been trying to get Neil Duggan to get rid of the stuff this stuff this trailer. He sent a few letters, but no fine. He definitely voted a $25 a day fine for uh, storage trailers. And because it wasn't enforced. My neighbor has been emboldened and added a boat, a dump car, and many other things. Um, Thank you. It created a real mess across my house. It's affecting my uh, quality of life, my values. And uh, this is town property. This is a paper street. How would you like to live across it? And I can't get the town to do anything about it. So I've had my neighbors sign a petition requesting that the selectmen transfer the end of North Ave to the Conservation Board or to the Marshland. Maybe the Conservation Board can help me clean this up. And if that's not possible, I'm here to ask you tonight how you plan to clean up this mess that is on town property. Okay, thank you. Um, certainly sure. well within the five minutes. I appreciate that, Mr. Oh. Moran. <laughs> um, First of all, Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify, Mr. Moran, with all due respect, the town is not permitting a junkyard, okay? So I just, it, it, I know you, you're probably upset about this. It's ongoing. It's the first time I've seen it on preparation for tonight. But I, I will assure you that the town is not looking to create junkyards throughout the place or enable people to do so. Um, I, again, I understand there are a lot of things going on here. There are legal ramifications. And the town has to step so, tip, um, tiptoe around and if there's a private right of action, that's not for the town to deal with. And again, I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm saying you have to expect that. Um, but I will agree with you that obviously seeing things like this is certainly annoyance. It's a nuisance. And um, you know, I haven't had a chance to read Mr. Duggan's email, but I, I suppose that Mr. Duggan I've dealt with, and he's been nothing but up board, uh, above board, handling everything diligently and attempting to do it. So I, I, and again, I'm not saying you made any comments that were disparaging, but I will say I've served with him for a number of years and he's done a wonderful job. So I, I think you got to be very cautious and, and well, I know the irritations is there and I, I think we have to address that and we will. Okay. His letters are attached to that cold right here. Excellent. Mr. Agnew? Uh, two things. First of all, uh, that's not town property. Take the street, just take the street and leave me alone. Secondly, uh, some bylaw, there's a strict parameters for the junk bylaw. Oftentimes, that's a matter of interpretation for the zoning enforcement office and other buildings. But the fact is, it's not town property. And Mr. Duggan's email today, a lot of things, he has asked the to report complaints against the person who has that trailer on that property. 
Mr. Duggan. Just to clarify, um, I have sent, since I started aggressive enforcement in September, um, there's been some resistance. I have sent two fines. I sent four certified letters. The last one to the storage trailer company. Um, I heard from Mr. McGuire yesterday. He is in the process of having it removed, and it sounds like before the end of the month it's going to be removed. I also have my final option is to file a complaint in court, which is a criminal complaint. Um, uh, I've already made the determination uh, it is not in violation of the junk bylaw. Junk bylaw requires it to be 375 cubic feet of junk. A plow may or may not be junk. There are a lot of plows sitting in driveways in situ, uh, which is very hard to tell. As far as I'm concerned, without further evidence that this thing is junk, I can't call it junk. Uh, boat in the yard is allowed. Unregistered motor vehicles are enforced by the uh, city of police. You can have one, but you can't have any in your front yard. So if this is a violation, of that goes to city of police. The storage trailer is being aggressively prosecuted right now, and I guarantee it will be out of there. Once somebody, he has family fathers. I, I don't want to, I'm sorry, I, yep, take it back. As, as we, uh, there are, he has issues that we all have, that I believe he, he explained some of them without, you know, we all have family, you know, people are sick, or people are elderly, things like that, along those lines. And I, it, it's the sort of thing where it, the resistance can be because, hey, I don't want to do it, or, you know, I just got so many other things going on in my life. But six months or seven months where I started aggressive enforcement, to remove a very large structure filled with his stuff. It, it, it's going to happen, but I know for Mr. Moran it's not fast enough, but it will happen. Okay, so what I'm what I'm hearing here is, and I was at the Conservation Commission meeting last night as in my capacity as liaison of the Conservation Commission, and Mr. Moran made a, a nice presentation to CONCOM as well. It's a very interesting idea, and um, that might be an, ang uh, an avenue to pursue in the future, but right now, at least on my part, I'd like to continue letting this process go forward. But I want to just repeat to you what I heard here and what I get from the sense of the board, at least from Mr. Danahy speaking, is that we acknowledge this is a problem. We acknowledge that there's something that needs to be done. There are procedures that we need to follow to make sure that, for example, if we were to short circuit those procedures, it would be counterproductive towards the end goal that you're asking for. So we do need to follow that measured process. But I also pledge to you that we are following a measured process. And, you know, I can serve as the sort of the liaison or the, the touch, the, the contact person, because you have been doing a good job talking to many offices of town hall, many offices of town hall have been looking into this. And um, I think let's just keep at it, but let's make sure this doesn't fall off the radar screen. I think that's what we're that's what we're doing. I'd like to point out that the first letter sent to this gentleman regarding the storage trailer was in 2006. Do you have a copy of that? This is in the packet here? Yes, it is. Right. All right. Aggressive enforcement from 2006 to now has only been by me coming to every department in here <coughs> to try to get this cleaned up. I've written at least 20 letters. I've been to every department trying to get this taken care of. The only reason it's getting aggressive now is because I'm ready to stand out front with a sign that says town government's broken because it isn't working for me. You know? Gotcha. Well, the signatures that are signed in there are three of the abutters of the Paper Street. Mrs. Kelly, myself, and Mrs. Kosky. You have three abutters of that Paper Street that they're requesting it be you know, transferred to either conservation or cleaned up. Got it. Yeah. All right. I'd also like to say that... Can you please uh, identify yourself, ma'am, just for the record? Eugenia Kelly, 11 Button Lane. I live across the street from that. Sure. Uh, that picture you have there is a cleaned up version because usually there's a lot of unregistered cars sitting in the driveway there. Okay. On top of that. All right. uh, many people didn't want to sign the petition because they're afraid of him. Sure. And that's, so that's, un that's understood whenever there's petitions and neighborhood issues. Um, Unless there's anything new, I'd like to yeah. kind of move on. Oh, Mr. Duggan, of course. I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, Mr. Moran first started complaint in 2004, 2005. We had no bylaw against uh, storage trailers uh, of, of regulating them. 
we do have a zoning bylaw that says you may have a uh, structure for storage in your yard. Okay, not a building, it says you may have a structure. It's very vague and very encompassing. Um, the trailer is a structure. Um, I authored the bylaw because I agree with Mr. Moran, it is unsightly. I also drove around town and I see a lot of trailers that sit there for years, they're very unsightly. Right. I want to get rid of them <coughs> personally. My concern when we passed the bylaws approved by the AG in December 2006 <coughs> when I wrote the first letter was that this was a structure that was grandfathered, okay, and I explained that to Mr. Maria. Um, it, he put it on a back burner, uh, I sent the letter, he, the gentleman didn't respond, um, I decided not to pursue it because I felt very strongly that this perhaps is grandfathered. Um, at some point in time, a year and a half later, I talked to town council, town council seems to think perhaps it wasn't grandfathered. I think it's still a legitimate question. Um, I could have at any time made the call, this is a grandfathered structure. The appeal, Mr. Moran would then have to appeal me to Superior Court. I'd rather right. you know, do what we can to get rid of it for that neighborhood. And it's, uh, right. That's it. Okay. Well, the only other thing I was going to say is, and, and again, Mr. Moran, you know, the town's trying to address it in the manner that it, it, it's going to be beneficial. But your remedies, your private remedies, could be held elsewhere, and that's not a part of this board to deal with. So, and, and as Mr. Uh, Agnew said, it's a paper street. So, you know, that's not town-owned. Just because it's a paper street doesn't mean that the town has it. It's you have it, your neighbor has it, everybody presumably, if you had it, has some interest in that way. And so that's another legal ram uh, avenue that you'd have to take. But it's not this board that would have to address it. But I do think, you know, obviously they're trying to address the issues. I think knowing Neil, they're going to try to address the issues with the container. And if there are other issues with respect to the motor vehicles, then the police will address it and we'll see to it. I mean, there's only so much that we as a town can do. But clearly, if we can, if hearing that if it's grandfathered, you know, that's another predicament, another problem. But we'll, we will certainly address it and try to take care of as much as the town can. If you can handle it at all, great. And, and frankly, you're not probably the only one because, frankly, it's in my neighborhood too. Yeah. The problem is the uh, rights away for people to cop on and not to store his yachts. You know, he has a yacht. His property line is 10 feet from his house, and this stuff's on over. It's not on his property. All right. I'm going to. Um, so that's my point. I just like to get it cleaned up. Absolutely. And thanks for coming in and for helping keep this short. But I think everybody got their point across. Thank you, Mr. Duggan and, and Mr. Agnew and Mr. Danahy as well. Okay, um, Ms. Banger, I believe you had a walk in, and can you please identify yourself for the record? Thank you. Donna <coughs> Banger, 108 Captain Pierce Road. I'm here tonight representing the Beautification Commission. Yes. Uh, also, uh, to talk about junk, but maybe on a smaller scale, we are going to be having our Ship Shape Day on May the 2nd, and I want you all to, to know about it. We'll be um, handing out our, we have special green bags this year, easily identifiable with Ship Shape Day. May 7th, you said? May 2nd, Saturday May the 2nd. May 2, okay. Yes. Um, hours between 9 and 1, we'll be giving out supplies at Town Hall, and we ask people to have their sh cleanup completed around 3 o'clock. The uh, filled bags can be left by the roadside to be picked up by the DPW employees, as is always the case. Uh, we ask people to call us in advance to register the route or area they want to work on. There are two reasons for this. The first is safety. Chief Stewart is very supportive of our event and will assign an officer to accompany anyone working along roads where visibility or heavy traffic could be factors. However, this needs to be organized ahead of time. The second re reason we want people to contact us is to enable us to organize coverage. We try to assign people to areas they want to clean and still address the entire town. Donna, who do they contact then? More information is available. I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> you're saying contact so that people yes, understand. Yes. Uh, we have inf information posted on our on the town website okay. at News and Notices. Uh, but Ship Shape Day is not the only opportunity to clean up around town. There's an Earth Day celebration, also on May 2nd from 12 to 4 at the Situate Beach Association. This addresses uh, the beach uh, and neighborhood at Sand Hills. They are having, um, also on May 2nd, but it's from 12 to 4, and they're having events, a lot of events, uh, targeting elementary age children. And um, 
refreshments afterwards. They're inviting everybody who goes to Ship Shape Day to come by and have some refreshments there at the Situate Beach Association. So we want to support them as well. Also, I want to mention that on May 9th, the NSRWA cleanup of the North River Herring Run and First Herring Brook, which not only restores natural beauty of these waterways, but also makes them safer for the wildlife that inhabits them. They're asking volunteers to report to Driftway Park between 9 and 12, and we'll provide, we'll provide a cookout afterwards. Excuse me. More information at nsrwa.org. And lastly, the cleanup of the harbor inside the breakwater will happen on June the 13th. Volunteers can help remove rubbish that is washed into the harbor with winter storms. They also offer a cookout for participants. Those interested should call the harbor master for details. The Beautification Commission encourages and supports these and all programs that contribute to keeping Situate a truly beautiful place to live. As little as half an hour spent cleaning up a beach or roadside can make a huge improvement in its appearance. So we urge folks to choose one of these events and volunteer. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Banger. And Thank could you, you uh, perhaps give a synopsis of that to uh, both the Ledger and the Mariner? So We'd be delighted be to, to give as much That would be great. I can just see a little box showing all these things with little dates yes. and stuff like that. That would be great. And I think I'll also provide information for um, okay. people so at people Town Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the next um, walk-in, I believe there's still another additional walk-in. Um, I have a question just procedurally of Ms. Donovan and Mr. Agnew. Is it 7.15? We have a liquor license hearing and we're already five minutes late for that. What, what do we do procedurally? I didn't quite hear that. Second call. We'll do a second call. Okay. So if that's all right. Everybody right, fine absolutely. with that? Does yeah. that need to be noted as, as in full agreement or something or anything, whatever? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so there's an additional walk-in. Ma'am? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Eileen Jane, 111 Manhill Road. Um, I've been told and believe that I'm a reasonable person. I am a taxpayer, a property owner, and a prior appointed member of the Situate Conservation Commission, but most importantly, I am a senior citizen. I was surprised to see the policy change from last year's appointments specific to the Council on Aging. So here I sit. So with that, I'm going to ask this board to consider a person who has and will explore and define the needs of our elder population. We'll continue to promote and implement services for the elderly, as she has done in the past by researching, drafting, and presenting the Senior Tax Work Off Program, which was unanimously approved by both Selectmen and the town in 96 and 97. She has experience in business administration and has wide contacts in the community and among the elderly. <coughs> she has unselfishly attended the COA board meetings for approximately the last two years. Being the mission statement of the COA is to identify the needs and implement programs to enhance the quality of life and the independence of seniors. Nita Strode can do it. So on the basis of merit and fitness, Nita Strode has shown that she is more than competent and suitable for the position <coughs> and should be unanimously endorsed by this board as the newest member of the Council on Aging. I thank you. Great. Thank you thank very you. much for coming in. Um, moving on then, are there any other, any further walk-ins? Um, yes, please come forward. If this is about the appointment process, we do have two, or uh, we have appointments later on this evening if, if that would be a more appropriate time. So if this is, if this is not about the appointments, then we're pleased to hear what you are going to add. But if it's about the appointment process, we're going to be talking about that later. Well, at Nita Strode for Wyona Way, <coughs> I was here last Tuesday, as you're aware, at the sure. invitation. Um, as an applicant for the COA board, I 
it's on the agenda, and I see again that it's um, meet the applicant uh, for Council on Aging. Yes. That is not me. Just hold on a sec. Yeah, I know it's not you. <laughs> Thank you. Just thought I would clarify that. <laughs> it's a very good ringtone. I must, I must comment. <laughs> At Boston University, I hear a whole bunch of different ringtones, and that's a good one. Actually, I planned, I actually did plan that. It wasn't on me, but I did plan that. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> well, in any event, <coughs> pardon me, uh, last week, you as the chairman had said uh, you would meet the applicants, you would have a discussion, and appointments would be made. Yes. We were changing the format because in the past, uh, appointments were usually made at the end of the meeting. <clears throat> there were two people ahead of me uh, that you did interview, that you talked with, you did have discussion, and both were appointed. A third person was not in attendance with the audience. Correct. And you called them several times. <coughs> Correct. And interviewed me. <clears throat> Correct. Uh, the two before me, there was no time factor given uh, as far as conversation. I, I was given a time factor, but I did speak very short, as you will recall. Last June, my application was in for the Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. The same routine, <coughs> meet the applicant, um, except it was at the end of the meeting when the appointments were made. Mm -hmm. um, my question was why, when you set the ground rule that appointments would be made, why was an appointment made last week? Why is another schedule? And I wasn't invited to this, obviously I'm here because I am an applicant. My question is, right. why wasn't I invited? Why is this rescheduled again? There were two, two applicants and one was not here. Sure, I can answer that very quickly and I appreciate you bringing that up for clarification. You were not invited tonight because as you just said, we interviewed you last week or two weeks ago, last, last week. week, last week. Tonight, the only, this is the next agenda item. The only person on is, is Ms. Rita Rosen, who is the woman who applied and we asked to come speak last week and she didn't show up. So what we did is we held off making any appointment because both of you are applying for the same position. We thought it worthwhile and beneficial to have both the applicants have the ability to come in and appear before us and speak before us. And so then we would decide, given the opportunity, as to who to appoint. And I wanted to give this woman because I didn't know if she was ill or if she was traveling that day and unable to make it, I wanted to give her an additional opportunity to come before the board, which was on the very next agenda item. This is in fact exactly what we did about a month ago or three weeks ago with the uh, Affordable Housing Trust when there were two individuals uh, who had applied and we invited them both to come in. One was unable to make it because he was um, ill and so we waited until the other person had a chance to come before us and we moved accordingly. So what we're doing is we're just trying to move as efficiently as we possibly can <laughs> yet still give every applicant a chance to uh, appear before the board. Well, the reason I brought this up was mm -hmm. because the pr procedure is entirely different. June 24th, there were four candidates here, uh, two for reappointment, two applicants. I mean, they were, they were, they were applicants, they were not here. Uh, the board appointed, reappointed uh, two that were not here, appointed two uh, applicants also mm -hmm. that were not here. Mm -hmm. So this person that you're talking about was not here last week. My question is, because June 24 didn't make any difference if candidates were here or not. Right, okay. You appointed them and sure. this time was not, sure. so that was my question. Right, now I'm, so I'm sorry if there's been any confusion. Um, no, there isn't any confusion. I'm telling you how it was June 24th and when you said appointments would be made June 24th, but they said four people weren't here and they were appointed. Okay. Well, I apologize because there does appear to be some confusion, at least on my part. What we're trying to do is give every applicant a chance with that while still moving forward efficiently as possible. And that's, that's my answer. And I think we should move on to agenda item three, which is exactly this subject matter, if it suits the board. Fine. Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. So I'd like to meet the applicant. Moving on to agenda item number three. Well, wait. Are there any further walk-ins? Okay. Now, how are we doing on the 7.15 p.m. liquor license? They're here. They're here? What? Is Ms. Rosen here? Wouldn't it be? 
we just put it over and get it. Do it. Do it. If it's say, if, if it's okay with uh, oral, can we go ahead? Thank you, John. Yeah. So I will move on to agenda item three, if we could. Um, Ms. Rita Rosen. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, first of all, can you please identify yourself? For My name is Rita Rose, and I live at 8 Richfield Road Extension in Situate. Okay, great. Thank you. As you might be aware, we just ask applicants to come forward and briefly just say a few words and provide some background information so we can get a face linked to the application, and perhaps some of us have questions of you or maybe not. Sure. Um, but just if you could just say hi and tell all us right. what's going on. I'll just um, back up, um, Mr. Murray, and tell you that I was not notified last week. I was not notified by mail or telephone, and because of the superb Comcast service in Situate, my computer was down again. Okay. So I, we I was not here. For that. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly the sort of situation why we rescheduled thank you. to allow any invert inadvertent miscommunications. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for your um, patience. I very much um, enjoy being in Situate. I've lived here for many, many years, and I've always volunteered since I moved to Situate in the early 60s. Um, his Historical Society, Bicentennial, Beautification, Volunteers. I'm a registered nurse. I love my seniors. Um, I educate at Wampatuck After School Program. Um, I really feel that I could bring a lot of experience and fresh ideas to the Board of Chairman on the Council of Aging. Um, I have a lot of experience. Um, I feel that there's a lot of um, things that I could do to keep the seniors active, productive, healthy, and safe in situate. And that's my reason for applying for this position. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Oh, okay. Thank you for coming Thank in. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Ms. Rosen. And um, we will be, for, for Ms. Stroud and, and Ms. Rosen, we will be making appointments as agenda item number nine later this evening, now that all the candidates have appeared before the board. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, it being 7.30 or 7.15? <laughs> okay. Um, we are now going to have a liquor license hearing for uh, Oral Restaurant LLC at 146 Front Street. Do we need to read the legal advertisement? Sure. I'll read it, Mr. Chair, if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Danny. <coughs> the Board of Chairman, uh, I'm sorry, the Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, April 7, 2009 in the Selectman's Chambers, Town Hall, 600 Chief Justice Cushing, Cushing Highway, Situate Mass, at 7.15 p.m., now corrected at 7.30 p.m., to consider the application of a common victuallers all kinds of alcoholic beverages license by Oro Restaurant, LLC, for the premises located at 146 Front Street, Situate. The premises consists of a 4,670-foot uh, 4, square foot first floor dining room with two front entrances slash exits, one side entrance for receiving and one rear entrance exit. Board of Selectmen, Richard W. Murray, Chairman, John F. Danahy, Sean Harris, Joseph P. Norton, Anthony V. Vignani. And it was dated um, Thursday, March 26, 2009, in the Situate Mariner Legal Advertiser. Thank you, Mr. Danahy. Is there a representative from Royal Restaurant to come before us? Yes. Chairman, good evening. Sorry, first my apologies for being a little tardy. But <laughs> no worry, and I appreciate your patience in letting us be a little tardy on our side as well. Um, my name's Martin Pomeroy. I'm a Cough Goodman, a law firm in Boston. I represent Oral Restaurant. Um, you have before you the application. Uh, Jill King is the sole manager and sole member. Um, Robin King, her husband, uh, will be the chef at the restaurant. Um, one thing that I wanted to clarify that I know had come up it was with respect to the exact area of the licensed premises. They are as described in the application. Um, there had been a request for the exhibit to the lease which showed an outside seating area. There are absolutely no plans for an outside seating area at the present time. Um, that is something that we negotiated with the landlords so that in the future. We do think that that's a prudent thing to do. The area of where that can be has been delineated. We recognize we'd have to come back before the board for any kind of approvals before anything, anything can be done out in that area. Uh, the, the Kings have been involved in the restaurant business for over a decade. Um, Jill King's resume is annexed to the application, if you have any questions regarding that. 
Uh, Robin is the executive chef currently at Stella's Restaurant in Boston. He's been there for approximately the last four years. And uh, we're just here to answer any questions you may have regarding the application. Okay, thank you. Before we get into additional comments, I just want to point out to the selectmen that there was a uh, Exhibit B that was added, which was the, the plan like that. Okay, and then also um, Ms. Donovan provided us with an updated uh, cover sheet explaining potential um, motions. So that's what we'll be considering tonight. Any questions from the board? Before I open it up to, I anticipate some questions from the public. Just, Mr. A, just a couple of questions. I'm sure this is in the application somewhere. Uh, size. Size of the restaurant. Uh, the size of the restaurant. Please will identify yourself, sir, just yes, for absolutely. the record, since we have a lot of people here. Sure, absolutely. My name is Robin speak. King. Yes. I live at 130 Vernon Road. Uh, in respect to your question, sir, um, the restaurant will be approximately 140 seats, but we will be starting off with about 150. Um, I believe that we've already addressed the square footage, um, but it will consist of uh, roughly to start out about 115 to 120 seats. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, of course, uh, type of restaurant only, only, and, and that's a difficult question to, to, to answer. Right but what is your intention as far as uh, serving? What type of food? If I may, I've uh, printed up a bunch of tentative menus just to answer that direct question. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, the idea. Absolutely, you can distribute it. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, the idea of the menu um, is very straightforward in the aspect that uh, I grew up in situate and my idea for the cuisine is New England comfort food, um, focusing a lot on local ingredients, local fishing, uh, local fish, uh, local meats, potatoes, produce, so on and so forth. Very approachable. Not so much limiting to one type of cuisine, you know, not all Italian or all French or all Asian or something like that. Um, a little something further. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? I just have one, if I can find it. It was it was in the backup, and it doesn't mean. I was just curious. I've read it all, and you refer to a vanilla box. Yeah. In the description of improvements. <laughs> well, I, my father had a restaurant at one time, and I'd never heard that before. If I may, one more time. Um, basically, what I've what I've done is, the vanilla box is essentially what we will be working with. So what I brought for you there is once we actually gain the vanilla box, this is the build out. So upon Hamilton uh, presented the vanilla box to us, we went out and hired a national restaurant designer. Oh, so you're refer. So vanilla blocks is the generic footprint with the walls, yeah, sure. and then you. If you're a vanilla on. man, I got some good <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them everything. I like everything. <laughs> <laughs> but please, if you let's take a look at what we have planned. Okay, Mr. Harris. Robin, so the footprint, as I see now, the Welch Company building, that will stay the same. Absolutely. Your intention is not to make it any larger. No, no, not, not, not at all. all. The only work we're doing is basically. If I may, just just a seeking clarification because it deals with footprint. Is this essentially the entire first floor of the existing structure, or is it half of the first floor? Or what's the what's the uh, purely uh, informal? I'm not asking for is it one third it's or is it? Certainly not all of the first floor. Um, it's, it's a good chunk of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we're not. Gonna do yeah. No, that's fine. Because I just need a little at home scale beyond the square footage for me. No, I was just going to ask the Sam's going to say that then it looks as though that there may be whatever's going to be in the front of the, on Front Street, retail or what have you, uh, but your restaurant primarily is going to be coming off the back end near the parking lot and Correct. facing facing that direction. Correct. And the hours of operation that you're seeking for for the liquor license, what did, I didn't see that. I'm missing. What what, did, what are the hours that you're looking for, mm -hmm. Attorney Pomeroy? Or I mean, it's, that's somewhat in flux, so I don't think we're looking to have any restrictions put on the hours. I mean. I'm sure you can appreciate it's uh, tough economic times, so Robin's going to do whatever he can to uh, 
make a profit there, obviously, but it's it's a restaurant. It, it will not be intended to be a you know a late night bar or anything like that. But hours of operation are still what's still somewhat in flux. It's going to depend on on demand and what people would like down there. So, in terms of the license itself, we prefer to have that issue you know without restrictions on hours, so we can know for sure what's going on. How many how many uh, seats are you looking for, for in the bar uh, bar area, the lounge area? What's I I the bar lounge area, the actual bar itself is going to seat uh, roughly between 12 and 14 <coughs> people. Um, and there'll be sort of a lounge area, cafe, if you will, that will seat an additional 25. Um, whereas, and that will certainly be the large bar, the, the lounge bar area. Um, we're going to be very wine driven in our, in our food and our cuisine and our concept. Um, you know, it's so much fun to be able to cook up with different things that are running out of with, with wine. So I would say that. Dominant amount of the liquor sales. Hopefully, the wine. One thing that we have a conceptual area for is on your Mondays or Tuesdays, uh, we're going to offer basically a prefix menu paired up with wines. Um, bring in local wine today as local wine makers out of Rhode and stuff like that. Come down. We'll actually, while you're dining, describe their wines, describe how they make it, why it's paired with each course. And also, that would be really interesting to bring. Sorry. We're getting back to the hours again. Uh, not to attempt to restrict it at all, as the attorney pointed out, but but uh, there has to be some hours put on a license. I mean, it's just two o'clock. I mean, one o'clock. You, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying? We're not going to give out a two o'clock license here, uh, even though I suppose legally I think we probably can. It's not going to happen. So you're going to have to, I think. I'll just suggest this. Come in with some suggested hours that you'd like to operate, because I don't intend to vote for a, a blank. I agree. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, and two o'clock license, I ain't gonna have, you know, at least I'm not going to vote for it. But having said that, I don't want to put you in the spot necessarily tonight, but if we're going to vote this, you better come up with some hours. Um, I, I, again, it's something that's a little bit in flux, but if you, I mean, if and if you asked them to pick an hour today, I mean, Robin and I really haven't specifically talked about an hour that would go on the license, but if 1 o'clock was acceptable to the board, I mean, 1 o'clock would certainly be acceptable to him. Um, the, other, the, no, the, right the other restaurants in, in, in the harbor are all 1 o'clock now. I think. They don't stay open that long, but I think the license... Uh, 11, 11 for you. Can you please just identify yourself so we move on? I'm Aaron. I'm the owner of Famous Restaurant. You have an 11. I think everyone else has a one. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a procedure question for me. Um, when I was reading through all this, um, I noticed your 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 letter from the attorneys, uh, Rebecca Peterson, was um, dated November 21st, 2008. And so I was reading through, and it says. We previously discussed lease for the premises and the process being finalized. That all makes sense. And please do not initiate going through this process until the lease is finalized. <coughs> is there a, a reason why you put a letter in before the lease was finalized? Then you ask us to sort of wait. And why not? Is, is there a? We I'm, I'm not an attorney. I don't know any of the ins and outs of this, but it just seems why didn't you just wait well, till the lease was finalized and then do it then? We, were, we, were, we had coordinated that with the town. It really was that we had hoped to have gotten the lease signed shortly after we had prepared all the uh, application materials and submitted them so we could have been on a little more accelerated time frame. Yeah. The lease negotiation simply dragged out longer than we had anticipated. And that, yeah. was, that was the main reason for that. We don't want to schedule something and then have to put it off for two months. No, that makes sense. No, I just wondered if there was a... Um End of year deadline or change in regulations you're trying to oh. nose under the tent or something. Oh, okay. okay. Um, how many liquor licenses are there available in town based on our population based quota? We have Yeah. 
And there's one available. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Donovan. And what is your approximate time frame? Because you do say somewhere through here that there's other processes, other boards you need to be going through and so on. What's your rough time frame um, that you anticipate being able to open your doors? Uh, as far as the time frame to open the doors, I'm really shooting to be open by mid-August, um, you know, as we all know, I mean, certain sure. things may arise, but that's, for me, the sooner the better. Yeah. Okay. Other questions from the board? This is not your last chance because I'm sure there's going to be some audience questions and that might stimulate additional thoughts from us, but any questions right now offhand? <coughs> no. Okay, is there anyone in the audience who wants to say anything? Can you please uh, identify yourself? Sure. My name is Evan DeLuty, and I am the owner of Stella Restaurant in Boston. Yep. And I'm very proud to say that um, Robin King has been working for me for four years, uh, about a month and a half before we opened, and has been the um, example employee uh, from day one. Has just been a remarkable person to work with, and um, I just wish him the best down here. And uh, if anybody has any questions about his integrity or his uh, representation of my restaurant, not even as his own, was quite remarkable. And I think he would be a uh, wonderful, and Jill as well, would be a wonderful addition to the uh, neighborhood of Situate, the town of Situate. And I also live in Hall Mass. I will own the next town over. So I'd be uh, very excited to be joining him for a beer and a uh, IT. So. Wine. Yeah. Or wine. Or wine. Or wine. <laughs> wine. Uh, a nice bottle of red. A nice bottle of red. Okay, thank you. I will say, uh, sir, thank you for coming down, and um, thank you, I've eaten at your establishment myself, so uh, got some good credibility there. Um, we have received a number of letters from various people in town, and I will just add that, um, you know, expressing various comments, but every single letter we receive does speak to this individual's qualities and the the training and the background and all this sort of stuff. So. The, the, the questions that people have have nothing to do with, with character or integrity or the, the type of establishment or anything like that. So regardless of how this is, is headed, your comments are, are well taken and uh, I think everybody in this room is unanimous in, in echoing that aspect of this. But it's good to hear it directly. I, I, you know, obviously I haven't seen any of the letters, Chairman, but um, you know, coming, this is a very difficult industry. Yes. And, uh, it's a, you know, at times, Positions, even at executive chef, can be short-lived, and you know it's just um, it's nice to see somebody like you know Chef Robin here to uh, extend themselves and, and work it out for you know four years is quite a long time. It happens to be you know uh, pretty tough for the store. That's okay. Fun. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you for being patient. Good evening. My name is Robert Brooks. I represent the owners of the building, Hamilton Realty, or Mar-a-Lago LLC. And we're here uh, in action to support the uh, petition for the license. Um, as you know, the Hamilton Company has taken, undertaken a very extensive and extensive renovation and preservation of this building. And we feel very strongly that the quality restaurant that Mr. King is proposing will be a cornerstone of the building and allow the financial viability of the whole property and the whole development. Parenthetically, I'd like to add, as I walked in tonight, um, I believe I was here before the United States and I've been in for a number of years, and I hadn't met uh, Mr. King before this evening, and I walked in, and Mr. King was on one of my little league teams. About 20 years ago. So <laughs> <laughs> I've known him for a long time. He's a good, he, you know, he was a good kid then, and I assume he's a good operator now based on the representation of the owner of Stellar. And so we, we wholeheartedly uh, hope that you will approve this uh, license application. Thank you for your comments, particularly appropriate on opening day. <laughs> Mr. Harris. Jill O'Ryan, I'm, I'm just double, uh, Rob, I'm sorry, just going through a second time. You guys must have been TIP certified. You, how often do you have to do that? Every four years. Okay. I just, I didn't see it in here, and I 
tips uh, and serve safe as well. All right. Okay. And if I may also, uh, once we form a staff um, for front of the house, one of the initial process um, for all staff um, that will be serving alcohol is that we're actually going to bring someone to the restaurant and make sure that everyone is tip certified, not just one manager. Uh, basically, the way it goes is that if you have one person who's tip satisfied, that's satisfactory. Mm -hmm. um, but we feel so strongly about it that once we do have a, a front of the house staff, uh, we're going to bring someone down to make sure that every single person is tip certified. Uh -huh. Question for the attorney, if I may, again. Um, I don't recall, and maybe because my memory's not great, um, but was a restaurant part of the original plans for when this, when the renovation was proposed? Our, uh, construction coordinator. Right. And I do remember being very happy when you guys came in with the, and by the way, it looks great, and Mr. The, Brown is here. It looks great, and I'm very, very pleased with the way it, it's coming along and, and the revitalization. But I am curious about whether a restaurant was part of the original plans. My recollection is not the greatest as well in terms of the timing, but I believe when we first came before either the board or the planning board, um, I don't remember the exact dates of that, but at that point, uh, I do not believe a restaurant was part of the plan. And if it was, uh, at that point, I'm not sure that everybody knew about it. It was still probably in the early stages of sure. negotiation. Okay, great, thanks. Sir. Thanks for that. And we did receive your letter. Um, I so I just up. wanted to return to you. Yes, we did receive your letter, and certainly I read it nice the others as well. <coughs> Mr. Harris. Now might be a good time to mention that uh, I, I see a lot of familiar faces out here, and you know, <coughs> I have talked to different people, and the, the fear of another restaurant in such a small town, summer season, short. And as I, you know, I've been thinking about it for the last week, I almost look at a restaurant like this, Jay, as a way, you know, yeah, it may compete with, with everyone, you know, all the other restaurants, but at the same time, I would like to look at a restaurant like this as another draw to bring that many more people into the town. I, you know, I, shame on me for not going to your, all your restaurants is, you know, more than I do, but I don't leave situ too often. I mean, we have plenty of good restaurants in this town, and I'll make an effort to even go more. But I just look at this as bringing more people in. And if someone were to come from a few towns away and they go to this new restaurant in the line, or what if, for whatever reason they don't go, well, they don't have far to go and they can walk to your restaurant or go in the, in the back to the Millwall. That's the kind of the way I look at the restaurant business. I, I know you may not agree and but that's it's a little different than maybe some other businesses i you know like that's just you know I, i've been tossing around this for a few days and that's my thoughts on it unless i hear something that changes my mind in the next few minutes i you know like to hear from anyone sure i agree with you i um, i i've been owner of reba for a year and I, anybody who wants to come in and open a restaurant, run a restaurant, my hat's off. My hat's off. My main worry here is not so much, I think it was addressed right here, that, that <coughs> building was not meant to be a restaurant. What happens when they go in and establish themselves and then somebody wants to go into the pier, which is important on the street, go by another restaurant that is just as big as the one they're proposing. Like, in a declining population of situated in the economy that we're in right now, I had my best year ever this year, and I lost money. 
So, and I won't, I'm not ashamed to admit I lost money this year. Am I going to go under? No, I'm not. But I could if the town is not careful in who and what they allow to have happen in that immediate town. Okay. Other questions on this vein from the board? Okay. Sir. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Neil Larson. Uh, I actually uh, Are you a, company. address? I'm sorry, 46 Woodland Road situation. Thank you. Uh, I actually own a software company up the road and uh, right up in Norwell in the office park at the end of uh, Grove Street. Uh, we often bring people in and we really do have to go out of town to have a really nice uh, I think that the gentleman, uh, sorry, Mr. Harris, was very much correct. This will draw people into the situation. Um, I eat a lot of the restaurants around here and I'm, I'm happy to go there. They're not, they're not, they don't draw you in. And, and I apologize, I've not eaten at your restaurant since you've taken over ownership, but I will. I don't need to apologize. But I do believe that you're absolutely right. This will draw people in. People want high-end restaurants, like what Robin is doing. Uh, his talents are excellent. His food is outstanding. And this is the kind of thing that this town really, really needs. They can't settle for mediocrity anymore. We are too far out of the way. We need to bring people in as an attraction and not just be part of the highway. So uh, since we are off the beaten path, I think we really need to go with high-end stuff like what Robin is doing in order to draw people into the economy. Okay. Thanks for that. Other comments? Well, I, I, Mr. Larson, I would only beg to differ. I, I don't think there's mediocrity in the restaurants here in town. I, I, I think they're, they're well done. Um, I, I also would agree. I, I understand, Jay, uh, not only your plight, but other people who've submitted uh, uh, peop uh, documentation, both through representation as well as um, their own letters. And I think, you know, our, our, our position just for tonight is whether or not a liquor license should be issued. Um, and if somebody's coming in with credentials, uh, to open up a restaurant, um, we are in a position of looking at that to see if whether or not their application is reasonable. If it is, then it meets the four corners of what we as a Board of Selectmen are obligated to do um, in licensing through um, liquor license. If it wasn't, then I would be inclined to say, no, we're going to decline it. So, um, But on the other hand, I think we as a Board walk a very slippery slope if we are to begin to enter into an area or an area where um, we are going to begin to limit the type of businesses that are going to come in and um, because it becomes very arbitrary and capricious. In this case, we could say no to Mr. Uh, Robin and, and um, I'm sorry, Jill, Robin and Jill rather, but I guess I'd have to turn the clock back a year ago and then say, well, why should we allow that restaurant or why should we allow this restaurant and so on and so forth. Uh, we could turn this into another area, forget restaurants. I mean, there have been two uh, real estate companies that have opened up on French Street. Um, so now we have a lot more real estate companies. Uh, you could turn it to lawyers, frankly, because you get a lot of lawyers, and they're great to bash. Um, so I, 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 I agree. <laughs> so I guess the slope that we're running. I'd vote to why limit that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the reason why I say that is, is because our function, if we begin to do that, we walk down a really bad road. Um, my feeling is, is that competition will weed that out. If I want everybody to be successful, I'd like to think Sean's version of. Uh, it's going to bring in more business um, because people begin to say, hey, look, there are a whole bunch of restaurants. We go here, we go there, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. will work. Um, I hope it doesn't go in the other direction, which means that it could actually affect other businesses. But um, at this point, I don't think we as a board can, can try to determine that because we've got an economic situation, which is bad to begin with. They're taking a chance of trying to open a restaurant that may you know, not succeed. I hope it does. I hope everybody succeeds. But... Um, I just think that if we were to decline that tonight, just based on that alone, we would be wrong as a board to um, to do so because then we're going to be subject to any business who's looking for some kind of licensing, and I think that puts us into a really bad position. Um, so that's why I, I, looking at it, I have read your letters. I've actually read Mr. Warner's letter. I've read, talked to uh, you know, his attorney. I've talked to other letters that have been submitted, and, and I have to say that you know, um, you know. I just hope you're right that it, there's enough to go around for everybody. Um, but that's that was my position. But I will say, with all due respect, Mr. Larson, it's the restaurants are not mediocre. All person, I think. Mr. Norton. I, uh, six months ago, or seven, whenever it was, when uh, Mr. Brown came in and, and uh, as the new owner of the building, and explained to us his plans and what he planned to do in the renovation that he planned to do. We. We, I mean, we were uh, 
give high praise to Mr. Brown. We thanked him uh, very much for coming in and, and turning that uh, building that was starting to run down faster than we'd like to see, turn it into uh, hopefully a, 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 a crown and a harbor. I guess it'd be very hypocritical, I think, in my part to to now say to him or to the uh, the owners of the building, you know, well, we thought it was a great idea, but now we don't because we're not happy with something. So uh, I I'd have a hard time when I think back about the the enthusiasm we had for businesses going into that building and to see that building renovated to vote against something that they're proposing now. It's just, uh, and I echoed what other board members have said. Where do you draw the line? Is it real estate agents? Is it banks? Is it sub shops? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult unless someone comes in with a flawed proposal or someone comes in with a, a character background that, that is highly suspect, uh, felonies involved, etc. Uh, it's very, very difficult legally to turn, to turn someone down. And, and this application is just the opposite of that. And the, the character of the, of the, uh, the new owners appears to be just the opposite of, of having a bad background, but uh, rather a, a very good background, a very respected background. So that's my thoughts on it. Just um, I just have a, thank you, Mr. Norton. On my part, I came in and I still haven't made up my mind yet. Um, I've been torn in both directions for some of the reasons Mr. Harris stated. And I just want to make sure we vet a couple other angles that I just need answered and I want to hear from the rest of the board about this and other people. Um, I too have spoken to many people, received the letters and so on. I'm with Mr. Harris regarding the competition. Um, aspect and uh, and uh, thus I, I hope that the letters we received are are inaccurate or, or not able to predict the future but I do think this could potentially serve as a magnet um, and help bring people in I know um, at various times when I've various rare occasions when I've eaten in other towns I've um, discovered restaurants that I didn't know existed because I'm going to one place and I see another place. And so I think that actually can work. Um, but I do have a, a concern about, and Mr. Agnew, I forget the exact legal wording, but the benefit to the town or the, um, for the good of all mankind or whatever that phrasing <laughs> is. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Well, the premise of the liquor license is to Regarding the zoning, so if we were to say no because it isn't zoned or something like that, right, then you're saying that would get overturned. Correct. And if we say yes, and then there's a zoning issue that comes up later that prevents the restaurant from going in, then there's no license. There's no license. Okay. You, you won't actually issue, I don't think you'll actually issue a license, have them pay for it, sign off on the license, so if there's time to pick up all is that right, Kim? Yeah. All right. That's that's very interesting to me. So we have you're we have one subject to that, but you're not going to release the license until they've received all the necessary permits, whether it's zoning board of appeals, board of health, conservation, land <coughs> board, whatever right. they have to go through. Because right. here's here's my personal here's here's the thing I'm rolling around, is we do have a number of restaurants in a 300 foot radius of the the new building. 
good. <laughs> Thank you. We do have a number of restaurants in this it, in this radius, and we have one liquor license left to give. And say in three months someone wants to open a restaurant up in a relatively un unserved, underserved village, North Sichuan, Hummer Rock, Greenbush, then we no longer have the latitude to give them a license because we have used up our quota. That is true in terms of the, 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 the quota. However, as we did, or as we supported, the C3 went to the legislature and got another license for city. So you petitioned town meeting to ask for another license, but you've got such a great idea, you've got a real good <coughs> project coming in. Um, we can do that? Yeah, yeah. Anybody can do it. Town meeting. Town meeting says yes, it's a great idea. Submit to the legislature. Legislature goes bang, bang like that. They run through 100 of them a year. And you can get a license that way. It's been done many times and it's been done here once that I know of. Okay. That's my question. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Mr. Orenberger, can you please uh, identify yourself? Sure, uh, Bill Orenberger. I'm here tonight. Uh, restaurant in Hill Mallies. Uh, Bob Warner, I think it's submitted a letter to unfortunately got a state face. Steve Warner is here, as is Walter Thomas. Uh, at the outside, one of the things, the purpose we're going to speak to is, you know, to serve the public needs, which I think we have some discussion by the board about. And certainly in no manner is this any questioning of the skills or abilities of Mr. and Mrs. Kane, which my clients feel are very finely qualified. It's more of a question to get to the well, one question I'd like to ask a little clarification if I could to council is I, I heard I'm just trying to get the number of seats in the restaurant and bar I heard 150 and then I heard the certain bar seats or whatever what's the gross number of seats because my reading of it was 175 seats <coughs> is that correct so as we threw the chair could you please answer that 140 seats I believe in the application I think their current plans are 115 seats that includes the bar area? Okay, thank you. Right. Um, thank you. One of the, just a briefly part to pull from the, I agree with all things the board say about free competition and all these, even though we are in unprecedented times with job loss and things on those lines, but the chapter 138 is a different provision and, and, it's, and it's based on the need to serve the public need for an adequate number of places which the public has contained different sorts of beverages. That's what the statute says. And at least I've been in town, grown up in town my whole life, and contrary to one of the prior speakers, was uh, quite content with uh, all the various array of tools and situate and restaurant tours, so I think you do a very good job here. <coughs> and in line with that, at least between GTL and Mallies, there's, there's other issues we get to the public need. Right now, there were four in the harbor property, <coughs> not to include Mr. Mulvey's restaurant, who's here for the way. There were four eating establishments with full liquor license. From my observations and what my clients are telling me, uh, there is existing additional capacity in these restaurants. And so, the question really what the public need is here. One of the, for the selective attention, one of the relevant cases uh, which Appeals Court has discussed is the uh, Valorant case. And a couple of the criteria in going directly to what the public need is, uh, it needs to assess what the public want and the appropriateness as to see of the location of the liquor license. So I think we've got some discussion before. There probably are some places in town that are that are probably under uh, underserved by virtue of uh, having liquor available with uh, food. Secondly, under that case, is to actually get in, to actually look at this and to see, you know, what are the views of the inhabitants of the location of the locality relating to that. You have only have the read the public record. I know there's several, several letters that you have, at least from the opinion of the people who are the restaurant tours in this, that there isn't a public need for this presence. In this unprecedented time, 
uh, between T.K. O'Malley and the Bill Watt restaurant. They employ over 230 people. And I would assume, if you look at the other licensed liquor establishments, restaurants in town, there's probably more than several hundred people with existing jobs that derive their license from. And with the feelings of my clients that the public need is not there, it's a matter of fact that it is going to diminish the patronage of their respective restaurants to some degree in all likelihood cause the loss of jobs in the difficult economy which which already exists. But to get back to the whole point and to I'd, a, I'd ask the board to kind of separate obviously anything that's been proven to sit with harbor is very much in the in the wants and needs of the town and I certainly I certainly agree with that. But to compare different types of establishments that come in there, in the case of a liquor license, there's a very specific statutory provision and it's directly tied into the need, the proximity. There's four licenses in the immediate, um, basically on the same street. There's at least one other license, two other licenses in very close proximity. <coughs> so from a client standpoint, Respectfully request the board not grant the requested license. All right, thank you, Mr. Warnberger. Mm -hmm. Sir. Hi, my name is Dave Keith. I live at Nine Shades Ranch Road. Um, I'm in favor of the, uh, the licensee. I've known Robin and Jill for the whole lot. I guess the credentials speak for themselves. I was a business owner at uh, Constituent years ago as well. I was in Southern American Cable Systems. I like our restaurants in town, I've been to them a lot. Uh, and uh, I think that from my look at it, there have been several studies by the United States Restaurant Association that show that when you add restaurants to the mix, more people come. It becomes a destination. They buy <coughs> gift store, they go to movies, there's a lot of uh, collateral opportunity that, that uh, is created uh, as a result of improving this economic time. You've got investors that come here buy a building that needs to be fixed up and they do it at this time. And you've got people who are willing to take a risk and start a business in town. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some effect initially, but I think it only benefits uh, as times go up uh, you know, in a rising tide, all ships will rise. And so uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it will help all other restaurants. I think uh, we want to become a destination uh, for, uh, for uh, a place to eat on the South Shore. And uh, I think it's a good idea to very important business component making the restaurant successful. Thank you. Would it be open for lunches as well, or is this an evening only establishment? Uh, our thought process out of the gate is to open up strictly for dinner, um, and then as we grow, eventually we'd like to start offering a Sunday brunch perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but my th our thought process is let's open for dinner, let's do it perfect, get that perfect. Then let's do brunch, let's do it. I've opened a couple restaurants now, and I've done it the way I just discussed, and I've done it the opposite way with, let's open for lunch, dinner, brunch, breakfast, everything else, and it just, it's a catastrophe. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. I just to follow up on something he said. Rick, you said um, if we vote to authorize this or approve this tonight, we don't actually award the license until they're all ready to go? Well, you, won't, you won't hand over the license until they have all the necessary terms. So therefore, they can't operate. Right. Now, <clears throat> say there's some unforeseen snafu, completely not due to anything of anybody in this room, all right? Bolt comes from the sky, what have you. And say it takes them five years before they open their doors. I don't think you'll be around <laughs> But I'm just talking to you. I chose, I, chose, I, I chose an intentionally absurd time frame just to, yeah, make, just to make my point, is um, we still that license is essentially off the table for future right. applicants. Is that correct? Uh, although I think that there comes a point in time, and I can't tell you when that is, but there comes a point in time when, when I think you can say this is being hung up too long. Yeah, there has been. Yeah. It doesn't have all of these legal problems. It isn't being appealed yeah, yeah. all over the Massachusetts state. <coughs> back that license 
war, and as I said, you can always go to the GP. Somebody comes forward with a proposal like that to us. You did it for a cheap rate. Somebody comes forward with a proposal like that to us. And I don't think town meetings are going to have a problem. And, and I know the legislature, the legislature can care less. Yeah, for real. Okay. All right, Mr. Norton. Yes, I need to make a question. To respond to that for one second, if you wanted. Um, the license is renewable, as you know, so uh, if it were a situation where there was a problem that could not be corrected, the license would not be renewed when the application for renewal was submitted. I mean, we anticipate that the license would be issued. We then would have to go to the ABCC, have the ABCC approve it. Um, but we can't make use of it until we receive our building permit, have built the space out, and been issued a certificate of occupancy. I think my questions were just in that exact area. I'm just. Uh, would you like a motion? If, if, if I just want to. This is obviously a, a subject of great interest to many I, people. I, like, so I just I want just to make very sure, since the rest of the the agenda is relatively brief, I just want to make sure everybody's got a chance here. Walter Collins, 194 Front Street. <coughs> um, I'd like to see the town do what the gentleman asked. Uh, down on, uh, the harbor, and that's an existing restaurant like Riva that didn't have a liquor license. It was an existing entity that was going on and applied for a license to get a license for, or maybe to teach the reason or something like that. Restaurants that don't operate as, or, or close and reopen to issue license rather than to an existing building, existing location, and to bring in a new entity that didn't exist before, um, I think would serve uh, the town better. Um, as far as uh, Mr. Meyer, what you said on the, uh, I was outside, I didn't really hear it all, but uh, as far as maybe the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission will not accept a application unless the lease is complete and final. Uh, it can have the contingency about the liquor license. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, that's, that's what I'd like to say. Right. Thanks, Walter. Well, I'd take that point just a bit further. And if I'm hearing Mr. Collins correctly, that you couldn't submit, even apply for a license, the, AB, the ABC, until occupancy permit has been issued. Is that correct? Is that the way you understand it? No, I mean, uh, historically, uh, thousands of restaurants have been, applications have been submitted to the ABCC while construction is uh, ongoing or even permits are, are being pursued. Um, that, that's, that's commonplace. Not the occupancy, I wasn't saying that. I'm saying the lease has to be complete and final. Okay, the lease. That was lease. It can't be a lease that's still in negotiation. Right. And it can be accepted usually by the town. You have a signed lease. And we, we do have a signed lease. Yeah. Correct? Correct. Yeah, that's what I thought I saw. All right. Um, other comments? Mr. Warner, can you please identify yourself, even though I just identified you? Warner, um, you could be on Front Street, uh, Newark. Over. Um, unlike Jay, um, Jay's got a terrific restaurant over the river. Uh, we've been down the harbor and kind of see that dynamics uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, we opened the new in 1984. And the summer, the summer months for us are very good. Uh, most years uh, we get the winter fine, um, but the last year anyway, it's, it's, it's very difficult. The economy's not not great, uh, and we've, we've been through those periods before, 1991, uh, a few other years, uh, and we um, we make money in the summertime, but for eight months a year in the harbor, uh, we compete, and we compete for every meal, and I don't think, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that any year in the harbor that we've been there for 25 years, 
seven or eight months of winter time, we have broken even. Uh, all our money comes from that three or four month period. Some years, we hang on by our fingernails until April and May come and change of, uh, change, change of time. We can actually gauge our, gauge our volume on the hour that is increased in the spring. Um, and, and people come out and they start, uh, uh, they start uh, visiting our restaurant. Um, we think, we think that, uh, that there is ample need in the harbor. Um, adjacent to our property, uh, we have Reaver. We have, uh, actually, we have uh, uh, TK O'Malley's on the other side, our own restaurant. Just down the street a little way, we have Finn's. Um, and it's our feeling that uh, an additional restaurant, uh, maybe not in the summer, uh, maybe not in the summer, but certainly in the winter, will we'll dilute the current 25 year customer base that was built up. And uh, we think it will severely, we think it will severely hurt. That's one of the reasons that uh, I'm here. My brother couldn't make it tonight, and he submitted a letter. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Steve. Um, as far as the letters being read into the public record, are they, someone mentioned that that was important or requested, and well, are we I able to just I say by submitting, by submitting they become part of the public record? Public record. Okay, because I just want to make sure these letters just didn't go to us and we read them, but they are part of the official packet or whatever. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Warner, and I guess this is also directed to Agnew and, and Ms. Donovan. If I'm understanding right, though, regardless of whether individual board members believe that this may serve as a magnet or not, competition is not part of the grounds to award or not award a license. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Mr. Ornberg. Right. Or yep. After doing all the evidence, the number of liquor licenses in the area, yep. they can find that there is a public need in the establishment not the service. That yep. is the standard upon which a license is granted. Staff. And public need, I understand, is can be different from competition. Right. Absolutely. Sir, once again. believe that is correct. The, qu the question in the comment was, if this license is granted, there are zero available in town? That's my there are, okay. Zero yeah. annual all alcoholic licenses. Okay. Available. All alcoholic. What would still be available? Uh, no one's applied for a seasonal, but yes, seasonal would be available. Okay. Does that answer your question? Well, it does answer my question, but the trend of the population situation continues to decline over the next five years. It's part of the quarter that a license has to be revoked. Is that correct? I don't know about that. No. That's a good question. No. I read that. No. I never heard that. And I and I honestly I read in some of the letters about the population decreasing and I I I don't know where that came from because everything I've seen, the population is increasing. I think it's 18,000 when I got here. I think it's still 18,000. 20,000 by the most recent. I think century. everybody agrees, though, the population is not exploding and going way up, which is the main, which yeah. is the main point. Yeah. Whether it's going down by one percent or up one percent, it's bouncing around yeah. 18 plus or minus. Mr. Paley. Yes, uh, I believe we have one. Can you please identify yourself, sir? Norman Paley, 50 Eli Avenue. I believe we have one restaurant in Kitchener that holds a license that's currently closed. Yeah. And I know the board in the past has uh, frowned on having a license out there that is not being utilized. And that's a separate issue which, which may or may not be addressed by this board in the future. Is that correct? That's correct. Currently, that, that uh, establishment filed for bankruptcy you cannot, filed is in bankruptcy, you cannot uh, revoke that license. But thank you for bringing that forward because that's that is a uh, lurking uh, question out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Further questions or comments from the board or from the audience? 
All right, can we just uh, hold on for a second here? All right, any questions or comments, or how does the board want to proceed? A motion, if you want, unless sure. unless you want to talk further. Sure. Motion. Who would like a motion? Go ahead, Joe. Uh, Ms. Donovan? <laughs> Okay, so regarding the hours, I would like to, bef uh, before a motion is read, if we could just have a conversation about the hours, perhaps someone from the board could suggest some hours and then sure. bounce it back and forth. I just would think it would mirror the, the hours uh, of the other restaurants in the hub. Well, we have different hours for different Well, we have one that that's closes at 11, the rest of them close at 1. So I don't know why, I, I, I'm guessing that the opening hours are pretty much the same during the day is 11, 11 a.m. in the morning till and I ask you before we get into this I just want to make sure you have every opportunity here do you want to decide to try and decide the hours now or you and your client or do you want us do you want to think this over for two weeks and we can put you on again yeah, we would I'm just giving you the option I appreciate that thank you um, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. okay well let 1 p.m.? 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, now, um, again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm just trying to cross every T and dot every I here just for the purpose of discussion. We have another restaurant in town, though, that ends at 11. So one could argue, and I'm not necessarily making this argument, that we could go for whatever closes first. One no, we can complicate this battle. all night long. I mean, well, no, but I just I mean, because yeah, we don't the have the easiest way, Rick, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, sure. would be for the if the restaurant that closes at eleven is interested come to back. come forward and we'd extend the license to that's one perfect. rather than yeah, yeah, that's yeah, perfect. It's, it's, that's that's a perfect option. Yeah. All right. Did, did you hear that, Aaron? Though, yeah. if you if you do decide, the board will, will entertain shifting hours for your your restaurant. Uh, to conform with the other restaurants, and that that that'll be up to you to, to come before us, and we'll entertain that. Okay. Further questions or comments on the hours? Okay, Mr. Denny. No, I guess if everybody, I, I was going to initially propose during Monday through Thursday to 12 o'clock, and then to 1 o'clock on Saturday, Friday through Sunday. And um, but um, because if it's more wine, I'm thinking you're not going to be drinking wine from 12 to 1 generally. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, July 1st. <laughs> After July 1st. I, I was sure going to propose be. that as my the hours. To know <coughs> if they wanted to go to one on the rest of the I might make it the same as the other restaurants. But like I Joe's. think it be consistent with the other restaurants, and I'd, I'd go along with that. Now. All right. Motion? Certainly. Will the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a common victuals, all kinds of alcoholic beverages license to Oro Restaurant, LLC? 146 Front Street for a 4,675 square foot premises with a first floor dining room, two front entrances and exits, one side entrance for receiving, and one rear entrance slash exit, seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. Further, subject to a successful inspections by the building department, board of health, and fire department. I second that. Okay, there's a motion and there's a second. Is there any further discussion from the board? Is there any further discussion from the audience? Okay, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All against? Mm -hmm. So it's 4-0 uh, in affirmation. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you all for coming in. Thank you, Thank you all for the uh, good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that was agenda item number five. So we're going to return in just a quick minute. Allow people to
We can please clear the room. I just didn't. Uh, gotcha. Just yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Kim, you want the air conditioning on? Ann, Burbine, could you please close the door? Sorry, please close the door. Okay, agenda item four is a uh, is the poll hours for the upcoming town election. Motion, please. Move that the board of can vote to set the poll hours for the town election as 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday, May 9th, 2009. Second that. Oh, whoa, wait. May 10th, Sunday. Yes. Yeah, May 10th is Sunday. Are those the shortened hours? I thought it was. I thought Bernice wanted from nine. Those we want the shortened hours. Yeah. Oh. Yes. All right. All right. Um, you all received the memorandum from the town clerk uh, earlier this week. She has asked the hours on you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday night. I apologize. Sure. So if we could have a men. There was a men the hours. Why? Why are we amending? Oh, okay. I see. And by math, um, yep. Makes sense. Maximum, or minimum, excuse me, of four hours. Three. Like we leave her memorandum discuss cost savings. Yes. I didn't see it. We just got it. So, Bernice, uh, Ms. All right. Ms. Brown's recommendation is uh, 9 to 3 and May 9th. So, that motion was not seconded. So Second. Uh, no. So could you just reread yeah. it? Uh, I, I the, didn't quite hear yeah. what you said, so could you please reread it? Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to set the poll hours for the town election as 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday, May 9th, 2009. I'll second that. Motion to second for the discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? So that's unanimous 4-0. Thank you all. Okay, we have agenda item number six is an update. Uh, from Mr. Uh, Jeff Rosen uh, regarding the Massasoit uh, Community College ongoing um, <coughs> efforts regarding a, um, a, a small campus here in Situate. You might recall, Board of Selectmen may recall that um, upwards of a year and a half ago we had Mr. Rosen and several other members, particularly from Massasoit Community College, come in and make us a presentation about their interest in opening a satellite campus um, here in town. Um, focusing on um, marine engineering and uh, technology as well as other aspects. And at the time they were interested in potentially setting up temporary uh, operations out of Gates Intermediate School, um, which was visited and um, discussed and potentially moving forward. Um, but since that time there's been ongoing ups and downs and ins and outs of plans and Mr. Rosen is here before us to give us a brief update uh, for uh, information to the Board of Selectmen and make a, make a, uh, a proposal regarding a potential location um, along the driftway. And with that introduction, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Rosen. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you again this evening. Um, as Rick, uh, as Mr. Murray has uh, pointed out to you, uh, we've been in pursuit of this for well over two years now. Uh, some of faint heart may ha might have given up uh, in already, but uh, we, we have um, strong support throughout the community and also from Massasoit Community College. Uh, I'd like to uh, make note here that uh, recently there have been some rumors of a, uh, a cessation of interest on the part of Massasoit Community College in uh, pursuing this, uh, th this um, uh, opportunity and that is uh, completely false. Uh, I recently had uh, a meeting with uh, uh, Dr. Wall, the president of Massasoit Community College, and he indicated to me that uh, if anything they're more interested now than they have ever been in the past because of the role that such a uh, campus and effort may have in retraining and in uh, creating new jobs and uh, newly trained um, professionals in these particular areas where w in which I believe everyone believes there, there's going to be um, great new opportunities in the future. So Massasoit Community College is still on board. Um, the last time I left you gentlemen, uh, you had recommended to me that we needed to have a uh, nonprofit organization in place to uh, shepherd this effort uh, through. Uh, we have in fact accomplished that. Uh, I'd like to say also with uh, the help of uh, Mr. Orenberger uh, uh, for with some legal advice. 
Um, and we have a, a nonprofit organization in place, and we are in the process of getting that certified as a 501c3, uh, which means that we will be able to accept uh, um, uh, t tax deductible, or uh, I'm not sure exactly the legal terms with it, but um, people will be able to, and corporations will be able to donate to us as a nonprofit organization. It will reflect so uh, on their taxes and processing of, uh, of, of their financials. Um, we have on this uh, organization, which is now called the uh, Marine and Environmental Education Alliance, we have got a stellar board of directors. That board of directors includes Mr. Ed Lofgren, who is the owner of 3A Marine and is very influential in, uh, in Massachusetts marine trades. Um, fr uh, retired representative Frank Hines, uh, who is very enthusiastically uh, involved um, in the project, as uh, well as Jack Conway. Um, so we, we've got some, uh, some leading citizens in the area. We've got uh, quite a bit of um, business contact um, as well as influence on our board of directors. Um, the board of directors has charged uh, me as the chairman of the organization with uh, locating a uh, viable option for a location. We cannot go out and raise any funds. We cannot convince anyone that we're for real until we have a footprint. We have, in fact, uh, designed a preliminary building. Uh, um, uh, we designed it for a particular site. That site did not work out. Uh, we're going to have to see how that uh, building works on another site. But we have got architectural support. And thus far, I'd like to, in, uh, like to um, make sure that, that everybody understands that all these efforts have been voluntary uh, with, with no money expended. So all of the work that's been done has been done by volunteers. That, of course, has got to end soon. Uh, if we're going to be viable, we're actually going to make this work, which is part of the reason for having the 501c3 in place. Um, we have looked at multiple sites. Uh, those, have, as uh, the chairman has indicated to you, have, have uh, gone by the wayside for a variety of different reasons. Um, but, what, but what we do have now is we have identified a site, which I, uh, which I outlined for you in the documents that I uh, su supplied to Ms. Donovan. Uh, the site that we're currently looking at uh, was identified uh, th after arduous visiting of many sites in town uh, with, with Chairman Murray. Um, and we have identified a location uh, which is uh, along the driftway. Uh, very close to the train station, also very close to uh, to to the uh, marine uh, to, to the driftway park um, that is developing so nicely along the driftway. Uh, the site uh, is situated right along the driftway. It is located between the transfer station and the golf course. Uh, most people would figure that there's nothing there, but as you can see in the overhead photo that I have supplied to you, that there is a nice chunk of land there. That uh, piece of land has got uh, dramatic uh, uh, scenic views of uh, Fourth Cliff and the, uh, and the Herring River as well as North River coming into, um, in, in, into the split, uh, the, the, the entranceway out to the ocean. Um, the site uh, has got some limitations, as I indicated uh, also in the materials that I delivered to you. I want to emphasize to you that um, in, in preparation for coming to this meeting, I have uh, talked to, to Mr. Murray at some length. Uh, I have communicated with Mr. Agnew, Mr. Calicious, Mr. Duggan, uh, Ms. Hardbottle, um, as, as well as the Conservation Commission and um, previously a number of months ago with the, uh, the, um, the Education Committee and uh, Mr. Bangor. So uh, we, we have covered uh, the majority of the bases within Town Hall. There is general agreement that the site may be viable. Uh, there are some barriers. Of course, it backs up on the, uh, on the landfill. Um, there are setbacks from the road based on the... Um, on the uh, um, uh, the zoning, and uh, um, so there are some barriers that are going to have to be uh, have to be overcome in order for this property to be uh, to become a viable site. However, there aren't any other sites left, as far as we can tell. Uh, in order for this to happen, uh, we are going to need the cooperation of the town. Uh, we are going to need the land uh, made available uh, through some kind of a cooperative partnership, so that we can put up a building. I may also point out that while we have had um, uh, cooperation on the town, uh, on, on the part of all the town committees and employees, we're going to need more of that in order for this to uh, be brought to fruition. We need to not find the problems and the reasons that we can't do things, but we need to find ways to get this done 
if the town of Situate wants this kind of a facility within its borders. Uh, if we cannot make it happen on this piece of property, I fear that I it's going to go to some other town along the South Shore. Um, uh, again, Massasoit Community College is committed to this happening and there's a need for this kind of a facility. So uh, what I am looking for this evening is I'm looking for um, uh, a commitment on the part of the Board of Selectmen, on the part of the town. I'm looking for your leadership uh, for the rest of the uh, town government to say that we encourage this happening, that we encourage finding ways to make this happen, not finding reasons that we cannot do it but rather finding reasons and ways to get this done. We are hoping for the selectmen to give us a commitment that, we, that if, if within the next two years we can get all of the barriers removed, we can make all of the permits happen that we need, we can get all the, appro excuse me, all the approvals from all the commissions and boards within town, that the selectmen in the town of Situate will then make a commitment to us that you will go into partnership uh, so that we can go out and we can begin saying to our potential donors we have a footprint we have a home until we have that there's n very little else that we can do we have reached the point that we need that in order to proceed so I'm here uh, this evening to uh, to to ask you to make a commitment that the site will be secured uh, for the uh, educational facility it fits into other plans within the town and other efforts along the driftway um, I also, again, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment uh, to step up in a leadership role within the town uh, structure to, uh, to, to make this a, a mission of the town and something that we try to do, not something that we try to prevent. Uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, uh, <coughs> do you think you have enough depth in this site? And I, I was lo looking, going back and forth, 1,500 plenty of frontage you think you have the depth Great. It, it's one of the uh, challenges that we're going to have to uh, uh, address um, my understanding from mr. Duggan is that we have a need for a 60 foot setback okay. but that 60 foot setback could be used for roadway as well as parking um, we also Laura Harbottle pointed out that uh, there may be a need for a, uh, a back a buffer, buffer in the back from, from, the, from the uh, from the landfill um, uh, and these are all things that we have to address, but there was no way between the siting of this location and now that I could get all those answers. I did touch base with everybody in Town Hall, asked everybody to articulate what the potential problems are. There are also uh, DEP uh, monitoring wells on the property. Uh, there is a slurry ditch on, this, on the property. All these things are going to have to be addressed, but, but uh, un until we have... A, you know, somewhere along the way, I'm going to need to come up with some dollars. The only way we can really come up with dollars of, uh, is we need, to, we, we need to have a site right. to start with, which we have not had to date. I can just follow up one question, one part about that, after walking the land with, with Mr. Rosen. Um, it's deceptively big. I know it, it, it all comes down to feet and mm. inches, right? But it, when you walk it, it is deceptively big, and you can see very clearly where the edge of the landfill is and where this is and where that is. It's, I mean, you probably know this land better than I do, but when you walk over it, and, and the contours of the landfill you can see from the aerial photo, it's kind of, it's, it's not, you know, parallel to the driftway. There's some ins and outs of the, of the, um, of the um, landfill. We're not talking about anything over by where the methane's burning off or that building is or any of that. We're really looking at the, the wooded area. This your heat. Yeah, right. That's right. going right. to go out. <laughs> but it is really a large area, and I, and I think it was Mr. Agnew or someone, or maybe Mr. Banger, someone said, you know, exactly where it goes obviously needs to be figured out but probably more towards the uh, east or, or north to the right of this particular thing it's a really big area when you walk around it's like wow I have no idea definitely you know and it says 1500 feet of frontage and that so but just by looking at the picture yeah. you know, if it's 1500 across it's got an item hopefully it's deep enough it's, yeah. it's well, a good spot it, it's you know I mean you're not far from the driftway park and right. depending upon what type of programs you have the, you know yeah. the, right the, we not I think Mr. Rosen said that there's, you know, up till now there's no there's no silver bullets, there's no bullets that'll that'll kill this deal, and, right. and uh, I certainly am more than willing to have him move forward on this plan uh, on this piece of land. Having said all that, the word commitment sometimes can be a scary one because we uh, I don't want to be sitting here three years from now and say you know have someone else the board committed, and by committed they meant 
five hundred thousand know. dollars. Right, uh, and that's my question, I guess. Not that the money couldn't be raised, but I mean, right. for, for to commit to to uh, any amount of money, town of situates money tonight, mm -hmm. based on what we're going through now with budgets, would be a very difficult commitment. I mean, I can commit up to a certain point. As I said to you, Mr. Norton, when I first came here, is that we do not expect the town of, of Situate to expend any money on, on this effort, uh, with the exception, potentially, of revenue lost through uh, leasing the property to somebody else. That, problem, that would not be, and that's admirable, believe me. I mean, that's, that's very few well, people yeah. come to us with that type of a deal. So, right. I, uh, you know, having said that, having you say, having said that, I have no problem making a uh, commitment tonight that this board that the selectmen and hopefully the board supports you and okay. to follow up on the commitment the, the part B is and just to reiterate and correct me if I'm wrong because I want to make sure I know what I'm committing to here as well sure despite hours of conversations and walking through the woods with you um, but it is good that um, and I commend town hall for all that for you and to town hall for having discussions with those people but you're also asking us to make to make it a uh, um, uh, continue to be a town supported and make it very clear that that we want to help DPW, we want to help Neely, we want to help Vinny as they work through with us. And that part is what you're also asking. Mr. Banger? Yes, uh, Mr. Rose, I have a um, The uh, several times it was mentioned uh, not be part of the problem but be part of the solution or worse than effect. Um, I, I guess I can't sit here and easily say that we have resources to begin doing work on this particular project. Uh, so, but in terms of uh, uh, helping expedite how work can get done, but we don't have engineering resources to go out and do geographic surveys or help with moving rocks and stones and take trees down and put it in the surface. So right. uh, with that understanding, I mean, we're very ready to help engineer, uh, help the engineers or whatever on the board. Right. And Mr. Banger, it has been. Is that consistent? Th that is exactly uh, what our expectations are. If we cannot put together the resources to do the site prep, uh, the architecture, uh, the all the legal work, etc., with this site, then we, then this will not happen. And we do we are not asking the town to expend uh, those efforts. Uh, n needless to say, as anybody else doing work within the town, when I go in to talk to Mr. Banger or his staff, I understand that, that the town is making an investment in their time because you're paying their salaries. However, we would not ask for the town to do anything by way of uh, site development or engineering, et cetera, other than the, the uh, inspections that it normally would do and the, uh, the support that it would normally give to uh, a development within town. Um, we under, you know, needless to say, we understand that if this process does work, the property will remain in the uh, in control and ownership of the town of Situate, which is currently where it is, and we would be uh, uh, tenants on the site. Uh, we also do not expect the town to have any expenses in putting up the building or putting in any of the other uh, um, the the other uh, installations that would be necessary to make this work. If we cannot raise the money through sponsorship, if we cannot find the support within the industry, within the state and the federal government by way of grants then this will not happen um, and we are not asking the town to make those investments however I do want to point out that if this does come to fruition the town of Situate stands to benefit from it um, in many many ways including financially so um, I, I think that we you know we're not asking for money we are asking for very very important support Mr. Norton? I'd like to suggest Mr. Chairman that, that uh, through you, uh, you, you send a letter uh, to the departments in town. This, I'm tossing this out for discussion. Uh, outlining our support of this proposal and asking department heads to do uh, whatever is in within their means under the current budgetary restrictions of such a way that leaves them uh, not so much an ultimatum to the department heads, but certainly a uh, let them know that we're in support of this project. Okay, that's a that good idea. That would be my thought. I'm, fi I'm fine with that, and I could work on the wording with Ms. Donovan and, and Mr. Agnew to make sure we don't inadvertently tie anyone's hands, yeah. you know, one way or the other. I think, I think given the fact that now, the people have to be in charge Right. 
and they've been great so far. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so far they've been great. Right, Mr. Harris. That's good. Sounds good. Okay. Do we need a, a sense of the board that Mr. Norton's uh, suggesting with a letter was enough to codify what we're doing? We don't need a motion or anything like that. Just a sense of the board. Is that okay? Jim doesn't I think so. Care. Jeff doesn't think so. That's great. Okay. The only thing again that I just want to make clear is that we what we're looking for is two years. If at the end of two years, I I and 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 our uh, our, our um, not for profit have not delivered. Um, I'll throw up my hands and uh, we'll, we'll go. We'll either go elsewhere or there'll be somebody else leading this effort. But well, we'll revisit. <laughs> we'll revisit in two years. If you're ten dollars short, I'd hate to pull the rug out from underneath you. Yes, but we we do but not believe that we will. One point two million short, then maybe right. we won't need to convince you of the other way either. No. So, yeah. Two years. Sounds good. Uh, great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Rowe. gentlemen. I I appreciate it. I, and thank thank you, Mr. Agnew, and everybody in the town for your help and support. I do appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Um, and then, Ms. Dunn, maybe we could. I'll, I'll talk with you afterwards about the content of that letter. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item number seven: a report from the director of public works. Is Mr. Banger in the audience? Mr. Banger. Thank you. Um, I want to update you on one area only and then open up for obviously any questions that you might have, which you seem to always have. Um, I want to talk about Flannery Field and the, on Hatherley Road at the Hatherley School. Um, the Flannery Field remains extremely wet at the lower end um, after any serious rainstorm or any, any uh, duration of even moderate rain. Now the background of this project that, that the field was was a playing field prior to the fall of 06, but starting at the fall of 06 and through the spring of 07, there was a project put in place to uh, rebuild that field. Um, and then the field was put back into play back in uh, 2007 in the fall. Uh, this was done with a contract for over $300,000 to mass pavement reclamation of Hanover, uh, a company with whom the town has done extensive uh, successful ventures. Um, the uh, work was overseen by the Department of Public Works. The engineering department manages like they do any other construction project in town with town funds. Um, the project was a big project to cut and fill, basically take the upper portion of the field, move it down and put it on the lower portion of the field. That basically meant uh, uh, moving on uh, the lower portion of the field, there's up to six and a half feet deep of material that came from the upper portion of the field. The decision was made to conserve money to make sure that they used as much as they could the materials on the site. So they took uh, earth that was at the higher portions, screened it to remove rocks and stones, and then used it to fill in the lower portions. The way that field is laid out, if you start at the top, you, you've got grass, and then you have about two to three inches of loam, four to five inches of sand, about 18 inches then of sub-base, which is compacted material that was on the, on the field to start with. And then beneath that is an extensive gravel and uh, drainage trench laid out of like a spider work that uh, brings the water that makes it through those layers, carries it down and into catch basins near the parking lot and then on, on across into our drain systems on the street. The, uh, the overall surface was built with about a 1% slope, so rainwater that falls on the upper portion travels on down to the lower portion and hopefully gets absorbed by the collection system and taken on off the field. What we see is that the north half of the field, the upper, if you will, the upper portion of this 1% slope, uh, dries out relatively quickly after the rain. In fact, that was the area that was really not disturbed. That was the area where earth was removed. But the southern half, where area, the area in which the earth was placed, remains wet like a sponge well after the rain has stopped falling. Uh, uh, what appears to be happening is that water fills up in that lower half of the field, the loam and sand layer, but seem to be tracked, trapped by the layer below that, that sub-base that, that was made up of uh, earth that was there before. It's almost like it was bentonite, which is used to keep water from flowing. Um, so it may be that the that layer of earth that's in there was too silty, had too much clay in it, and then when it was uh, put on the site, it was compacted too much. So it may be just tamped down too far. What has happened thus, thus far, in December, we rented a, a long tine plug removal machine uh, and then spread two to three inches of sand on the field and spread that back and forth to fill in the little holes 
uh, that were plugged with the big holes, the deep holes, eight inch holes, with the sand that was spread on the field um, in anticipation that that would begin to aerate the field. Now it's clear that we'll need to do that two or three times in the course of the next several years in order to get that field to be uh, have enough sand permeated into the soil to be able to uh, move the water through. However, we're also going to take core samples at the south end of the field to see exactly what's going on with each layer. How far down is the water getting and where is the water staying? We may end up that what we need to do then is cut cross trenches in that field laterally to take, cut a trench, put drainage in it and run it off whoops, towards the wooded side of the field to the, I guess that would be to the west. Um, and then cover that with soil and then sod. Now, and then additionally we'll do the plugging and the sanding several times throughout the year. So what I'm getting to is that this field will probably not be usable after any periods of rain until we complete this work. So that means between now and the summer we'll use it during dry periods but there will be cancellations of the use of that field by the recreation department for the safety of the children playing in that field uh, because the field is basically uh, too sponge-like to really play on effectively. If you talked to the recreation, they're aware of this? And yes. Yeah, so it's yeah, they canceled uh, play in the field, for instance, earlier this week bec because of this. There's a plan in place. Uh, yeah. The so, I mean, it's a great disappointment for uh, the planning of the use of the field, but the reality is that it, the field is not able to withstand mo uh, really moderate rainstorms and be played on almost immediately afterwards. What's the cost that we're talking about to replug it <coughs> every so often and potentially doing laterals? I mean, the, the field itself was 300000 to to do it. What are we talking about now? For example, what was the cost to plug it in December? And what are we talking about going yep. forward? Uh, the cost of plug, of plug removal was uh, quite high because of the rental of the machine. However, the golf course now owns the exact machine we want. And so we were working with a golf course. We'll use it. Um, we'll, we'll get a lot of use. It'll get use at the golf course as well uh, as at this field and any other fields that we so. feel is necessary to, to, to work on. Putting down sand is relatively inexpensive. Uh, sand is not expensive and then we use our own machinery and our own people to drag back and forth and, and do this plugging and sanding. Uh, the trench work is to be determined. Um, it's, not ex it's not horrendously expensive. We'll use uh, local contractors uh, to do trenching. Yes? Mr. Harris. But it takes it offline and that's what's crucial to Jennifer and the whole rec department. It was, it was such a long time coming for that field. And I have to say, and I'm you know, not pointing fingers, but the um, same thing was done at Central School and there isn't a problem with that. That was used to slope down towards Branch Street and the contract of by the first home, it's it was been raised up quite a bit to level it off and I don't think we have that problem there. It's just yep, a my shame. understanding of this so long for that field. Yeah. My understanding, and it predates me, but I've, I've done the research and talked with people who've been involved, is that a decision was made early on that um, to reuse the soil, the native soil that was there, uh, uh, clean it and reuse it, but it may not have been uh, the, the correct um, combination of, uh, of sand, silt, and such, and, it, and, it, and then it was compacted. Now, you know, who shot John, I can't tell you, but right now the job is to try to fix it. I agree with you. It's too bad that we're at this point. It's not something I certainly no one much likes to go back to something that was done and redo it. So will plug-in help? It will help but it might not really solve it. Plugging will help and we'll continue to plug it. It's the cheap solution right. but it may not be the fix. Right. Uh, what we have to do is take do the core sampling and find out if if the the problem is beneath the level of the uh, ability to, to do plug removal then we really need to go down and and work on that uh, so and the putting in the trenching and and backfilling and putting then we'll use sod to put on top of it uh, would could move fairly quickly but I still think uh, during this rainy season we're going to see a number of disappointing days when that field can't be used other questions yeah, just Danny. If, if you end up plugging it out and then you begin to after doing that trying to sand it that seems to me like it's a potential <coughs> two or three year process to try to improve it I've done some research on fields, and, and a field that, that gets potentially as much use as this needs to be plugged probably three times a year over the course of the next three or four years uh, in order to get enough sand and, and mix in there to, to make it a proper field. Okay. The reason why I'm asking that is... The 
the reason why I'm asking is that if, if we're looking at two or three years of trying to plug a situation that basically is, is not going to solve, and we're going to resort to trenching as the, the mechanism, so now we're talking about a potential two or three year lack of use of, of a field, or, or it's going to be disrupted, um, do we at least say, let's get it fixed so that we can get it done, so that yeah, next I think year, that's year after the field's going to be done, I mean, yeah. and then figure out what that cost is to determine right. if that's the best. We'll do plugging, um, Mr. Dan, he, no matter, uh, John, yeah. If we fix it, we'll still continue to plug. So what I'm saying is the plugging is part of the program, but the plugging isn't going to get it fast enough. So therefore, uh, I think, because I think the problem is below the level at to which the plugs will, will reach. And therefore, uh, we need to go in and put in additional drainage in that, at least the bottom half of that field. And that's why I say uh, we'll get on that, but to be conservative, I would say that between now and the summer, you know, midsummer, it's going to take some time to get it done. But we'll get on as soon as we can. A and that's the approach. As soon as we get the core sample, which we can do in the next few days, we'll know whether or not uh, we need to do the additional drainage or if plugging will simply solve the problem. Okay? Correct. But time is really, uh, we can hear the clock ticking. Is there anything else, Mr. Bennett? That's it. Thank you. Okay. I have actually a question for you. Okay. We're talking about fields. Um, I was approached by an individual about the um, the field on Beaver Dam, up on the, the Little League field, Roach. up on Beaver Dam. Roach field. What's that called? Roach. Roach. Yeah, okay. Um, apparently it used to be named after Bill Johnson, and I'm just saying names because this is well before my time, who apparently in 1953 started the Little League, and in 1960, this is according to an individual who approached me about this, has been around town for a long time. Um, it was named after him, and it has since been renamed. And this is something I've noticed. It's natural. Things get named, and then 50 years later, they get they get renamed. And this this individual is not suggesting at all that we rename it back, but that perhaps we could put a sign up there on the backstop or something that says, you know, originally named after Bill Johnson, who was a you know math teacher, football coach, founded Little League, something like that. We put a sign up there that says, originally named after Mr. William Johnson, who founded Little League and all that sort of stuff. Just so that name doesn't get lost to um, just posterity. And I don't know if that's your bellywick or recreation, but well, I just thought I'd bring it up since you're talking about I mean, I, I, I can actually keep putting the field. sign up, but uh, and in terms of I don't know anything about the history. If you know, Really, it should come um, through you guys. If that's how you'd like to have it done, I'd be glad to do that. I think it's fine, but could we... I just want to make sure we get it right. Yeah. yeah right. I think Someone else might come up and I say... I think we want to make Mr. sure Smith. that we have to have some documentation. I, I would imagine that, in fact... And, and I, I'm not saying it wasn't at all, but I'm just right. saying we have, there must be something somewhere that says it was named up Mr. Johnson, Bill Johnson. Uh, I was also spoken to by uh, probably the same gentleman you were. Yes. And, and I brought it up, and that's what was asked of me. You know, do we... I don't think anyone has a problem with it, but we somehow really have to make sure that this was in fact the case. So maybe you or I could get back to this gentleman. Sure. I don't know who to look. Who, who do I talk to? Well, maybe we can speak to, to, to George. <laughs> George, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, because okay, Little so League wasn't really founded until 1970, almost 1980, unless there was a little, little League back in the yeah, okay. 30s. I don't know, but. No, it was. It was. Huh? Joe started it. Joe started the little league. Okay. What I'll do? How, how's this? Just, babe, just for babe. way of moving forward. Old. Just for way of moving forward, I'll approach this gentleman and have him suggest some short wording, and then I'll I'll run it by uh, other people who have long memories in town, and then I'll run it by various people here. And, and maybe you might think about. Well, about five, about five yeah. or six yeah. years ago, right after. And we had some resolution to that, like maybe the whole field wasn't named after. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. Yeah. I was going to say, what could you do? Mentioned before. Or something. I don't remember. I don't remember. Guess what? We're going to name. I'll look into it. <laughs> you and you go. <laughs> yeah. I got a better idea. The parking. Over here. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> if it's all right with the board. Happy you brought it up? I'm very happy I brought it up. This, I just can't wait. 
uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, when I'm no longer chair, I'm going to need something to occupy my time. So uh, that's good to do it. it. <laughs> all right, but if, if it's all right with the board, I'll, I'll dig around and look into this and come up with some ideas. All right, great. Thanks, Al. Um, actually, no, oh. Al. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you, Mr. do Daniel. we have final figures, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, with snow and ice? Now that it looks as though that we're not having any more snow. News yes. I, I'm just <laughs> curious so we can get an idea of the final figures. Hmm? Yes. 285? Okay. Yeah. Jim, a couple of things for me. Uh, two things, Al. A while ago, I think we uh, we talked about that bus stop by the movie theater. We right. made a good suggestion not to take out the no parking so much because... Make it a drop-off. Yeah, make it a drop-off. In the meantime, the, step, the bus stop printing is still there. Yeah. And I think that even makes people shy of being a... Well, we, maybe well, you just wipe that, get that bus stop sign we, out we, of there. And we will. When, when we can start street painting, that's what we plan to do. Because the way you remove it is you street okay. paint it out, and then you put the new street signs in, and then we'll uh, we'll put appropriate sign up, up sure. there also. Okay, sure. drop off. Pick up and drop off only. Thanks. Okay. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, one other. Of course, Mr. Uh, when you first came on board uh, with DPW, you mentioned one of your projects, one of your, would be that Front Street, St. Mary's intersection by the church. Uh, it, ha it, 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 hmm? <laughs> it hasn't gotten any better, as we all know. It's uh, Front Street, St. Mary's, right where, right where right I want to put in a roundabout. No, I don't think you made, you came up with a suggestion. You just said you had a problem with the other section. It's and a three-way stop, you mean? Yeah. 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 Um, could you relook at it and see? Would you like me to? I would. Okay. Because it's it's. I hate crazy. it myself. I mean, I hate anyone that goes through that though, it's crazy. Right. I don't go down there because of that darn thing, yeah. you know. But um, I agree with you. Yeah. It's an actually it's an excellent place for a mini roundabout. Maybe. Maybe. It actually um, is. And it would keep traffic moving, and it would reduce accidents and be better for pedestrians. So, if you could look into that, I guess. Or Thank you. That's all I have. I'll come up with some alternatives. Right. Okay. I can't wait for another couple of weeks. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well. You're agenda. Welcome. I, Thank you, Mr. Banger. Yep. Uh, agenda item number eight: discussion, vote, FY 2010 budget and articles. Mr. Agnew. Okay, that's my kind of uh, agenda item. Uh, I just wanted, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Mr. Norton, without, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to truncate. No, you didn't. You didn't really. But I took out an email today. I think some, if you might have a chance to, to get it to read it. I, I continue with. I know all we we, we all are. I concerned with with next year and in, in, in the fact that we're spent in, you know just about what I. Be fair in saying every nickel we possibly have, right, and and, and then some. Uh, we found ourselves in a position where we just have absolutely no no savings to fall back on, whether it be in any of the reserves for any of the enterprise funds. Uh, we have a snow and ice. We just heard two hundred and eighty thousand dollar shortfall. We have no contract signed for next year, which the worst scenario could amount to three hundred thousand dollars. We uh, found some, some, some of the uh, methods of balancing this year's budget have fallen a little bit short, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of dollars short. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a major, major concern. I just want to bring it up so we don't lose track of the fact that uh, we have to be so very, very careful of, of what, how much we spend because we don't have anything to spend. Just to make sure I understand what's going on, though, and everybody else understands, town meeting authorizes, it does not require. Is that correct? Okay. So this is not selectmen trying to do an end run around what town meeting is authorized. No. 
I just want to make clear because I've had I've we received that comment. I think that's a good idea, Mr. Chairman. I think it's, it's again, not to try to yep. check him with anything, but right. six months from now, nine months from now, if, if one of the capital items that we voted is ready to start and it becomes more obvious at that time that we just don't have the money to fund it, or we don't want to burden uh, future generations of overworked term with the debt, we may want to reconsider that item. And I think that's a really good idea. That's one way to yeah, look at it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's all. Right. Comments? Yeah. Well, I was going to mention it other business, but I think it, it dovetails well with the discussion, and, and I raised it for last year and raised it again as a, a discussion point. But I don't think we need to set up for an agenda anytime soon. But whether or not we should be considered the CPC funding. Um, you know, for future reference, we might need, be, need to use that money for capital improvements for other things, and we may think about reducing it or eradicating it for a short term in order to be able to do certain fundings, whether for capital improvements that we, we can't get to. Um, you know, you always hear about sidewalks. Everybody's saying we need a sidewalk here, we need it there. Well, we're not going to have that funding, but maybe we should think about it and discuss it. I'm not saying we should, I'm just putting it on the table given the economic times to be able to say, Maybe we don't want to go down the road of CPC for the next two or three years. Maybe we want to sit, try to save the taxpayers money, but in the meantime, when it comes up to a major project, you know, we need to be able to find that source and we can, we can approach the voters. But I think, you know, it's something to discuss and debate. Again, I'm not wedded to saying I'm going to vote that way, but I just think we need to keep that on the table given the current time. So. Okay. Mr. Harris? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, moving on to agenda item number nine. <coughs> this is the appointments uh, portion of tonight. And I just want to remind folks that uh, we're discussing uh, or appointing Council on Aging. This is to fill uh, a term, an unexpired term, so there's one spot available. We have two excellent candidates. Both candidates have now been before us to uh, do the, the meet and greet. And um, unfortunately, we can only pick one of them at this point in time. So turn it over to the board. I can't make a motion as chair. Move that the Board of Selectmen appoint Rita Rosen to the Council on Aging. Second. second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? So that's a unanimous 4-0. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming in and for applying and for our consideration. Agenda item 10, <coughs> update on the town administrator search. Um, we have received a total of 54 applications received so far, which I think in and of itself speaks well of our town. Uh, the Board of Selectmen are continuing uh, in confidence and preserving confidentiality, uh, reviewing each application, and we are in the process of creating a smaller list of qualified candidates. What we are doing is we have each given Ms. Donovan a list of the candidates we feel are most viable. And we have asked Ms. Donovan to put together a list, to partition that list, so those individuals who appear on all five of our lists, those individuals who appear on four of our lists, and three of our lists, two of our lists, and one of our lists, as a brief way of seeing where there might be common ground. Um, we are now getting to where the list is going to get shortened. I would suggest just as a straw man discussion, one potential way that we could move forward um, while preserving the rights of the minority people that might want one or two of those individuals, I would suggest one way we could move forward would be to all of us concentrate on the list, on the list of names that appear on all five of us, all four of us, and all three of us. If we just go back and take a look at that. Um, we know how many that is. That's approximately nine to ten or so, which is a nice convenient number. And then 
after we uh, look at those, we can then uh, basically do it again and maybe narrow it down even mm -hmm. further towards the target date. I will say that we're now getting, there's two things that I as, as chair, but also just as a regular member of the Board of Selectmen, want to make sure we do. I don't want this to go out, you know, months and months, obviously, because there are a number of other town administrator searches going on and one would presume that there's some common ground in some of these candidates. So that's one thing. Obviously, I don't want to move forward hastily as well. And the second thing is, is um, as I've mentioned approximately 472,000 times, uh, I'm acutely aware of what's gone on down in Marshfield with their uh, town administrator search last year. So when we get to this next stage, I'm going to want to consult with town council as to the exact procedures that we need to follow in terms of open meeting law and confidentiality and interviews and all that stuff. But I think at this point, I'd like to suggest that we go towards, um, you know, those names that are on five, four, and three of us. Mr. Vignani isn't here, so we'll fill him in about this. But I will say, just to remind everybody, that say there's a name that y'all, one of you really, really thinks we need to discuss, and if there were on the one or the two, and you want to discuss it, absolutely fine. And uh, just let us know. But I would just suggest that that's the way we go at this point. Obviously, we've got something on our mind about next Monday called annual town meeting. But very soon thereafter, if we could have, we could re-rank these, look at these nine or ten names by, say, the Friday after town meeting. And um, I don't know about you guys. What do, what do we do? Should we try to get to five? Try to get to three. What do you, what do you want? Keep, keeping in mind that you can interview, uh, you can interview in private once. Right. All yep. right. So I mean, uh, and that's what town council is going to tell us. I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should take advantage of the fact, and I'm tossing this out. Maybe we should take advantage of the fact that we can interview in private once and not limit it to five. Yep. Maybe eight. Uh, whatever number we're comfortable with. Because obviously, if you have a chance to interview face to face with the person, you get a better feel for his or her character and his or her ability. Uh, so I think I would like to have, as you so suggested, Mr. Chairman, yeah. review the list, uh, cut it down, obviously, with the hopes of cutting it down to seven or eight. That, and then it did you that seven or eight. And I, I agree with Joe. I hate you know you you look at the resumes and they all sound good, but it, I think you you learn a lot by talking to that person and taking advantage of the fact that it you know it's private. You know, twenty minutes per, per something like oh, that. Hot, you know, and uh, I would I would I might open it up a little more than five. Okay. I I you know yeah whatever. Right. I want to pick a number. I don't want seven or eight. I want, let's just pick a number. And if, if, if there's a, if we all end up exceeding, I understand that. Let's just pick a number. Eight. Mr. Danny, you have Yeah, I, I think um, you know. But my my instinct is that you know you're going to see based on what I've reviewed <coughs> any number between five and ten. So I, I would be inclined to say if you need to pick a number, then stick, stick to eight. I'm, I'm erring on the side of more because I'd like to interview that number, go through it, talk to them, uh, see their demeanor, how are they going to um, you know, present themselves. Eight. And I think Eight. that makes sense. Okay. You know? So that's pretty easy. We have to eliminate one or two names from this list. Okay. But there might be others that we want to add. It so may be. It may eight. be. And if, if you feel, Mr. Chair, that the board feels that for some reason a candidate was overlooked by the rest of the board and feels strong, and maybe he could talk to you. Well, let us know. Right. Let us know. If there's a name on the two or the one list that y'all want, y'all let yeah. miss. Kind of water, yeah. Sorry, my mother is from Virginia, <laughs> and there's some <laughs> idiosyncrasies I picked there, up. There was, a, there, was, there was one that came in, I think, just yesterday and today, and I just had a chance to look at it, but I'd right. ask the board to look at it again closely. Okay, so let Kim, let Kim know about that. And then, um, what's the process about contacting references? When does that happen? I would suggest when we get down to the final five. Okay, so at this point, with there's, there's yeah. no going outside, just looking at the applications. Because once again, okay. I just I, I knew that, but I wanted to make sure it was confidential. 
uh, let's say we got to eight, yeah, yeah. and you start contacting references, the, the employee is going to find out that. Sure. Yeah. You know, so I, I think that's. Okay. It's protecting their privacy yeah, and, and, and the confidentiality that's involved. All right, so once we get beyond that, once it goes public, then it's public. By then, I think it's fair game. References are all out there because we put it out there. These are the lists. These are the people. All right. I think it's a credit, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, to the town and, and to what people think of Situate. And we had over 50 applicants, and they're still coming in. And, and, and more than half of those applicants are from from uh, people who are in the municipal yeah. world, shall we say, town administrators, assistants, etc. So it's it's a credit. Okay. So, uh, eight names. Yep. Eight names, regardless of the number, to Ms. Donovan by... Um, sure. What did I say? Tuesday. Yeah. That makes sense. Mr. Vignani's away this whole week, so it gives him a week. Okay. Eight names. Everybody on board with that? Sounds right. good. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, agenda item number... Um, 11 is other business. On my part, I already talked about it with uh, the Johnson Field, which I'll look into. I don't have anything else other than thanking Mr. Paley. Again, Norm, thank you. Anything else from the board? Nope. Mr. Harris, Mr. Morton, Mr. Daly? No, I, the, the, other than the uh, Green Up Day and Earth Day and everything, so. Okay. okay. Yeah, there is one other thing. Mr. Harris. Saturday, I think the recreation is holding their annual event down at Widow's Walk. I think it's the morning. He's the, he's the, Exactly. And I'm not positive of the time. John and I had a little difference. Ten o'clock. I don't know. Is it ten? I I, I don't know, but I thought I heard it was the afternoon. So that's why I was thinking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> don't listen to John. It's the middle of a golf day. Unless they wanted to get golf out there. Who is the pro of that? Oh, thank you.